McGillicuddy and Murderous Parmesan, Season 3, Episode 3, Mass Square, The Underground City. October 14th, 1921. Continued. Maskwell, the underground city. It has an eerie ring to it, doesn't it? Just saying the name makes my hair sort of stand on end, and my flesh creep. I get tingles. Imagine, then, what suddenly arriving there did. I landed on my hands and knees on cold stone. I noticed instantly that my skirt was wet around my knees. I squatted, lifting my head and looking around, and my mouth dropped open. I was not in my world. I could sense that. I wasn't in a cave on earth, or if I was, this cave had never belonged to the humans. It belonged to something deep under the earth, something with fangs on its soul, that lived and breathed in ancient rites. I could feel it in the air. I could feel it in my breath. I was an alien here. These walls belonged to something else. The cave led off in three tunnels from where I crouched. There were large mounds of ragged stone tumbling into the paths. Beyond the mounds of ragged stone, a thin light hung in the air. It came from an onion-shaped lantern glowing in the ceiling. The lantern didn't look like a thing made by human hands. It looked like a curled-up worm. A little to the left of me, a giant mask sat propped against the wall. It was red, with large round eye holes and a large round mouth. It looked perpetually shocked, or scared, or screaming, but in a weirdly comical way. I stood up. I walked to the mask, because it was the only thing in the cave that looked created. I touched it. It was made of wood, painted with old, crumbling paint. I peered into the open mouth. There was nothing behind it, just stone. I was very much in shock, diary. I couldn't think straight. I wanted to hide behind the mask. I sensed that I was an alien, that I didn't belong here, and I wanted to get out. Only then did it occur to me to look for another glowing eye symbol. Perhaps it would act as a portal and take me back. I looked behind me and there was nothing there. I really started to panic then. It's one thing to be lost in a cave. It's another to feel that you've been washed up like a piece of driftwood, on the shores of an alien land where no human being has ever breathed and no human being will ever breathe again. It was the most profound sense of isolation, like I'd been turned inside out. Despair reared its ugly head, until... Great Jehoshaphat, I said. I can teleport. I shook myself, shocked that it had taken me so long to remember that I wasn't a human. I was a magic unusual. I could do things. I shut my eyes and pictured the pawn shop. My fingers and toes went cold. I opened my eyes, and my breath frosted, just once, in the air of the cave. I can't teleport, I said. I hadn't been able to teleport in the Night Enthusiast's Cave diary. But that had felt different. Like I was bumping up against a thin, warm spell, almost like thudding repeatedly into the side of an elephant. This felt different. This felt as though I couldn't teleport because I was simply too far away, like a radio that can't get a signal. I sat down. My blood filled with warm, animated plans. I would keep exploring. I would hunt for a new eye symbol and hope that it took me back to my world. I would take one of these three tunnels. I would keep walking and walking, and eventually I would find something. This place wasn't devoid of life. There were masks on the walls. But first, I sat. I was dizzy with shock, and I knew I needed a minute. I felt like I was dreaming. Like I'd punctured something on the fabric of the world, and in the process, bloated my heart with steam. I felt pressured, uncomfortable, filled with a feeling of... Above all else, if you can believe it, embarrassment. I felt like I had no one but myself to blame for this. And honestly, that was the truth. Curiosity had definitely killed the cat. But I had yet to see if satisfaction would bring her back. I gave myself as much time as I needed, which was probably about ten to twelve minutes. I got very cold. My knees were still wet from whatever I knelt in when I arrived. 
I came out of the shock enough that I started to investigate that wetness. You remember, when I first teleported into the cave, that I said it smelled like blood? Well, it did. That was what the wet stuff was. But it was cold blood. It's hard to imagine blood being cold. It's either hot or warm and sticky or dry. It's rarely icy cold, but still thin and liquid. I had this moment of wondering if the blood was mine, if I'd smashed my kneecap somehow, and then I remembered that I'd been walking around just fine a minute ago. I crawled down the cave floor and found the puddle again. It was icy cold, but fresh. It was a little thinner than the blood I was used to, but it had that same sugary, coppery smell. I followed the trail of blood with my eyes, and I suddenly realized that the blood wasn't really blood. It was coming from mushrooms, twisted, ribbon-like masses that grew on the sides of the cave. They were bleeding down in trickles. Blood mushrooms. I suddenly had a horrible pinched feeling, like my whole body had been crammed inside a jewelry box. What if I was somehow at the end of the human race, a thousand years into the future? and the humanity had evolved into scummy, bleeding cave mushrooms. Honestly, I think that's what we deserve sometimes. But then I remembered the mask, and I realized that someone intelligent had to be here, no matter where I was. I stood up, dried my fingertips on my skirt, and walked forward. The shock was gone, thank goodness. I hate feeling like I'm inside a bubble. I took the path to the left, because I decided that, if it didn't go anywhere, I'd come back and continue down the other paths in the same direction that one reads a book. The tunnel smelled scummy and dark. I wish I had brought someone with me. I had a queasy feeling that this was somehow all a dream. Then all of a sudden, I heard a song. It was low and eerie, and it trembled on the cave walls. My hair stood up, straight as a cat's tail. I grimaced. But once the surprise wore away, I was oddly relieved. Someone was singing. That was good. There were people here, of some kind anyway, and the song reminded me of Noble James, although I wasn't sure why. I took off at a jog towards the sound. It was starting to get darker. The light behind me was fading. Then I turned a corner towards the sound, and things became bright again. In a well-lit, narrow corridor, I saw a man perched on a tall brown stone. He looked like a man from a strange book of nursery rhymes. He had dark hair and long fingers, and he sat perched on the stone like someone perched on the edge of the moon. One of his long legs dangled off the stone, ending in a short boot. He wore a top hat. He wore a black and red striped coat. It was Wrath. He was still singing. His eyes were shut, but I could see the long lashes of his puppet eye, laid like tiny wings against the wood of his face. And that's when I realized what the song was. It was the same tune that had allured Wrath out of the night enthusiast cave, when Noble and I had come to the rescue of the train car prisoners. I had been amazed at the time that a simple song could allure him from the train cars. He seemed like someone in a trance. I studied him now. Not sure what to say or do. Wrath, I said. Wrath's mouth dropped open. He looked over at me, stunned. He didn't move a single muscle on his face for almost a minute. He looked like he had no idea what to do with me, either. And then, suddenly, A human! he cried. He got up in a swift movement, hopping down from his rock and landing with a bounce that knocked his hat askew. And then, to my surprise, he threw his arms around my neck and hugged me, I stumbled back, completely shocked. Wrath took a step back. "'How did you get here?' he said. "'You didn't summon me,' I said. "'Me?' he said. "'I don't think I summoned you.' Suddenly, with horrible clarity, I realized something about where I was. "'Wrath,' I said, "'if you're here, is this the headquarters of the Death to All Mice?' Like a little boy, Wrath swallowed and nodded his head. Oh, no. Oh, no, diary. The headquarters. No wonder it didn't feel human. Oh, it didn't feel human. That meant they weren't people in masks. They were things, actual things, that went around and... Oh, I got so scared I turned green. 
Are you all right? Raph said. You turned green. Are they evil? I said. I mean, have they hurt you? Are they keeping you here against your will? Rath shook his head. They don't hurt me. They brought me here. Did you go willingly? I said. Well, that's the thing, Maud, Rath said. They arrived. They looked at me with their shiny eyes, looking out of their hooked bird-beak masks. I felt a surge of madness and wanted to go with them. He tapped the side of his wooden face. What I can't figure out, however, is whether or not I wanted to go with them of my own accord. I can't tell my madness from their madness. Is the puppet creature in me desperate to stay with these things, or are the things desperate for me to stay with them? Did they muddle my mind? I can't tell. I felt a shiver. But you didn't summon me here, I said. Not that I know of, he said. It was a glowing eye, drawn into the wood, I said. Never seen it before, Raph said. All right, I said, but if you didn't summon me, then chances are... They did? Raph shook his head. Oh, Maud, he said. I don't think that's possible. You see, the only reason I'm allowed here is because I'm not wholly human anymore. The Whiskelets don't abide humans. Humans aren't allowed in this cave at all. Is that what they're called? I said. I had a funny, rumbling feeling in my stomach. The Whiskelets. Yes, Rath said. The death to all mice birds. That's their creed. Death to all mice. But they're called Whiskelets. What does that mean? I said. Death to all mice. Haven't the foggiest, Rath said. I think they're barking mad. I sat down, right on the cold stone of the cave floor. Rath was not my first choice for the last human face I'd ever see. But they must have summoned me, I said. Someone did. Someone opened that portal. Well, it wasn't the Whiskelets, Rath said. The Whiskelets would grind you into powder if they knew you were here. No unauthorized humans. Grind me into powder. Oh, diary. I wanted to be home in my own little bed. What should I do? I said. Do you know how I can get back? Rath came and sat beside me on the ground. He picked up my hand and squeezed it tightly. My dear, dear girl, he said. If I could leave whenever I wanted, I would have left already. He lowered his voice to a whisper. I get scared at night. What should I do? I said again. At this point, I wasn't expecting Rath to answer me. I just didn't know, and I kept stammering about it out loud. What was I supposed to do? They're really going to grind me into powder if they catch me here, I said. Yes, Rath said. But they probably won't catch you. No one's in the nearest district, if you want to come with me. District, I said. Yes, Rath said. You can pick an apartment. In a haze, I got up after Rath and followed him down the cave tunnel. We stepped out of the tunnel and into a room so wide I felt a brush of wind. My mouth dropped open. It was a city. A weird, weird city. There was no sky, only an endlessly high cave roof. The buildings were light brown stone, with uneven complexions, like a termite mound. The buildings reminded me of stalagmites, skinny at the top and wide at the base, a little bit wriggly and uneven but with onion domes and bubble rooms that jutted out from the side. The buildings were beautiful, too, with red window panes and Italian balconies. There were hundreds of windows, thousands of windows. They glowed, milky golden, in the dimness of the cave. The buildings looked so warm inside, golden and glowing and civilized. Welcome to Maskwell, Rath said. Maskwell, the underground city. Maskwell, the underground city. I felt all the hairs on my arms stand up. It's enormous, I breathed. They like having space, Rath whispered. How large is this place? I said. Oh, this is only one of the districts, Rath said. Only one, I said. How many whiskelets are there? Twelve, Rath said. I was sure I'd heard him wrong. I tore my eyes away from the city and looked at him. Twelve hundred? No, Rath said. Twelve. As in, a beggar's dozen minus one. Total. Yes. They are the only beings that live in this world. And there are twelve of them. How big is this city? About as big as New York, Rath said. 
I looked back at the city again. I could see the end of the cave walls. This wasn't as big as New York. It was true. I thought I could see a high, silvery room in the distance with a giant fountain in the middle, and the city might have continued past it. But this was not the size of New York. There are other rooms, I said, full of buildings. Hundreds, Rath said. My gaze swept the city again. It was ready, expectant, clean, perfect. And the lights are always on, I said. Always, Rath said, unless they are coming. They arrive in the dark, I said. They always arrive in the dark. I stared at the twinkling lights, willing them to stay lit. How long has it been since they stayed in this city, I said. District, Rath corrected me in a dreamy voice. How long has it been since they stayed here, I said. Well, I've only been living here a few days, Rath said. But I think it's been about a hundred years. I started down the path into the basin that held the city. I felt like I was in a dream world, a museum display. Every building looked like it was ready for you, bright and inviting, as though someone had stepped away a moment before. You can hide here for now, Rath said. I meet with them every morning in another district. They don't come here, which is why I live here. There's plenty of space. They like their space. You meet with them every morning, I said. Yes, Rath said. They have a plan for me. They like to talk to me about it, make it sound all shiny. What is it? I said. That's a secret. Are you going to say yes to their plan? I don't know yet, Rath said. I haven't decided how insane I really am. I nodded, feeling a little bit sick. You live here, I said. Yes, Rath said. He pointed at a building far away, near the Silver Fountain. I live in that one. There are nice pens. Oh, good, I said. Rath, if you don't mind, I'd like to pick a building and stay there for a little while. You're not going to tell the Whiskelets I'm here, are you? Rath gulped and looked ill. Never, he said. I needed a moment. I needed to feel as green as spinach. The buildings looked nice enough, and Rath said none of the Whiskelets had been here for about a hundred years. I'll see you later, Rath said. And I hoped that wasn't true. Not in the sense that Rath would be my regular, I'll see you later, over and over, the last semi-human I'd ever lay eyes on, until the day I died. Don't be ridiculous, I muttered to myself. You can get out of anything, you always have. Even if I had to find the Whiskelet's magic room, assuming they had one, and plunge my hands deep into a cosmic goop, I'd get out of here somehow. I just had to be creative. I opened the door of one of the first buildings and felt soothed. It was beautiful. And that, I think, is one of my first clues about the Whiskelets. Decadent, unused beauty. No corpses or entrails, no skulls or creep. Just more luxury than they could ever use. Silent and waiting and empty. Because the building was so slender, the rooms were by nature small. A delicate staircase spiraled up along the back wall of the room. A table set with flowers and Germanic wooden chairs filled the first floor. I climbed the staircase to the second floor, then the third, then the fourth. I passed a library and a large bathroom with black and white tiles and a copper tub. With every ascending step, I felt like I was getting farther away from the Whiskelets and closer to something tucked away, hidden and safe. The fourth floor was a bedroom. Its ceiling was smaller in circumference than its floor. The walls were a little lopsided. With how smooth and bright the floor was, and how charming the little cream four-poster bed, I felt like I was in a whimsical children's illustration. I was tired. I wanted to sleep. Actually, I wanted to cry, but I wanted to sleep first. Was I going to curl up in the warm little bed? No, I was not. I could just imagine waking up in the middle of the night to find that the golden candles had all snuffed out and a thing in a plague mask was leaning over my bed. I made a nest under the bed, which is quite clean and quite high. I have enough headspace to be comfortable, and, even if the lights go out, what's to say they'd pick this house, this bed? What's to say they'd look under it? diary, I wish I could say that I was writing this entry from the warm, safe bubbles of a bath in McGillicuddy and Murder's secret basement, but I'm not. I'm under the bed in Maskwell, the underground city, 
and it's only an hour since I talked to Rath. I don't know what I'm going to do. If you never hear from me again, it's because my withered hand is frozen around this stubby pencil, and I'm quite corpsified. Oh gosh, why do I let myself think these things? <sighs> How do you not go mad when the only thing standing between you and madness is you? What can you choose? How can you bolster yourself? Diary. I just felt something funny. There it is again. I'm listening, but nothing has changed. You had better believe I checked, but none of the candles have blown out. But something is there. I felt it again. It's like tiny pinpricks down in the depths of my stomach. I almost feel like I'm sensing the faintest hint of an earthquake. Oh, diary. Diary, dear. I just got out from under the bed and peeped through the glass of the window. The lights are still lit, but they're starting to go out in the distance. They just went out again. That row. Footstep by footstep. The lights are blinking out. They arrive in the dark. I can't see them, but I know they're coming. In their long cloaks, with their plague masks, large bulbous eyes, and long hooked beaks, the lights are going out at a soft, even pace, as the whiskelets walk closer. I wonder, should I run? A purple smoke is moving up the street, billowing, snaking, like slow fireworks that are curling closer. They're announcing themselves. They're announcing themselves to no one. Unless they're announcing themselves to me. We hope you've enjoyed Season 3, Episode 3, Maskwell, The Underground City, of McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop is written and performed by Minerva Sweeney Wren. All rights reserved. Friends of the Pawn Shop, are you hearing an ad right now for Forgettable Frogs? Frogs that fit in your hand. Frogs that... Wait, what was this advertisement for again? Oh, wait, you're not hearing an advertisement. Do you know why? Because this podcast is free and always will be. This podcast is advertisement-free and always will be. However, there is a unique opportunity awaiting you if you become a $1 patron. Minerva Sweeney Wren hopes to start a second podcast called The Dark and Decrepit Planet of Spin, where instead of merely listening each week, you will solve real puzzles and make real choices that determine the outcome of the tale. Think of it as an enormous collaborative storytelling adventure. For more information, please go to patreon.com slash Sweeney Wren. Please consider sharing this podcast with your friends. A post on the audio drama subreddit an in-person recommendation, or a social media share, do more to market this audio drama than anything Minerva Sweeney Wren can do on her own. She relies on you. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop will continue with Season 3, Episode 4. Number 13.